I won the lottery with parents. My parents were fun. They were loving. Uh, they had stimulating friends, books in the house. Um, and we did a lot together, from playing cards to riding with my dad, uh, singing old songs, to going to the fishing camp, to duck hunting, getting up at 2.30 in the morning before we had uh, camps and leases and things like that, and freezing to death and wanting to sleep the whole time. But I, uh, I had a great childhood. So I went to uh, the public schools in Houma, Louisiana, Houma Elementary, Homer Junior High, and Terrebonne High. My mother was trying to urge my dad uh, to have me go to school elsewhere, uh, somewhere in North Carolina, and I fought that tooth and nail and thankfully won because I loved where I was. I went to LSU, and my father, like all parents, thinks his child can do anything, so he, he can convince me to take the combined curriculum. Since I knew I was going to go to law school, that that's, you can go to law school after your third year of college. I had started school a year early anyhow, uh, because I was five in the first grade. So I was the youngest person in my law class, and there were actually actual grown men there. Uh, we only had one female in our class at that time. And I was wondering, and I, so I, I lobbied my dad before, at, during the third year, why don't I go for four years and make sure I get a degree because LSU Law School is, is notorious for having a high uh, flunk out rate. And, and he said, well, I know you won't flunk out. And if you do, uh, you know, maybe the Marine Corps could give you some maturity. Well, that put the fear of God in me because that really wasn't what I wanted to do. I think the role model of my uncle, Claude, who was an unusual charismatic man. Uh, I, I, I'd go into his law office, he'd talk to me about some of his cases when I was young, and of course he'd come over to our house and he was uh, involved in politics and other things, and I, I just felt that that was something I really wanted to do. Uh, Claude Duvall, who was a combination of Lawrence Olivier and John Wayne, he ended up being a Marine Colonel, and he was on Iwo Jima with his brother. He was one of the most uh, charismatic and, and, and occasionally intimidating people I've ever known, yet loving at the same time. As my mother said, he was a man of many wins, but he was a taskmaster. I remember one story, one of many. Uh, after I'd been there about a year, we had an office meeting. We had an office meeting every Saturday where we would say how, what we were doing, problems we had, and income we might be bringing in. Those were, I was always very uh, apprehensive about these meetings. If you knew Claude Duval, you'd understand. And at one of the meetings he said, you know, I was here at 10 o'clock at night and uh, no one else was here. Books were all over the library table. And I was thinking, why do I need anyone here? Uh, really, uh, they, they leave at 5 o'clock, uh, they, 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 leave, they leave a mess, I don't think they're bringing in very much money. He said, maybe some of you, and he was looking right at me, should think about going to Sears and maybe selling shoes. Well, I got, I got the picture then, and that was my, 5 o'clock was like early for me after that. One of the greatest gifts my law partners gave to me and my senior law partners were, was to allow me to run for office, that is the Constitutional Convention in 1972, I ran for the office and uh, got elected and got to participate in the convention, which was a, a year uh, from January 73 till the end of 73. And then we, we had the task of trying to promote the Constitution because, of course, it had to be voted on. It was a great experience, uh, one where I met uh, people from all over the state, uh, some of whom became governors, some of 
many of whom were legislators at the time, uh, federal judges, and, and so on. And I made some great friendships and uh, learned a great deal. As a young lawyer, I did appointed criminal cases and had some criminal trials. Uh, I primarily, our law practice by far was civil, and we were the kind of firm that did everything from represent banks and electric cooperatives and businesses to doing some personal injury, some defense work, a lot of cases involving property disputes, oil and gas law, uh, public service commission work, and uh, it's it's hard. It, some some uh, early on some. Uh, divorce, separation, community property matters. And after about six years, I decided I would try to keep away from that uh, because I found it just uh, very, very, diff very difficult emotionally, especially when there were custody battles with children, et cetera. Honesty uh, to the federal judgeship is not typical. I, uh, it was not on my radar at all, nor did I do anything to advance my interest to become a federal judge. I was a senior partner of our firm at that time. My uncle had sadly passed away at 71 uh, in 1986, and uh, we were doing quite well. Uh, and I had no interest in becoming a federal judge. One, I would most likely have to move to New Orleans and uh, uproot and leave my firm, which I thought would simply crash and burn without me, which proved to be astonishingly incorrect. Nonetheless, what happened was Billy Tozan called me, said, the people who really want to be a federal judge don't like each other, but they keep mentioning your name. And let me point out, it's not that I'm so wonderful. I was simply somebody th they, they didn't hate, like they did the other side. <laughs> Uh, the, two, the two factions uh, vying for the judgeship. So uh, then John Bro called me. I said no both times. I had a long talk with my 13 and a half year younger brother, who's very wise. And he told me, you know, our family is about public service. Uh, you, you do gripe about the federal judiciary. This is your chance to do something. You'll live longer. You won't be as tense as you are in this law practice which I'm not sure was necessarily true, but uh, he convinced me to do it. I called John Bro and Billy, and the rest sort of just fell into place after that. Uh, right when I got on the bench, not, not shortly, shortly thereafter, I had the, a case uh, involving a book called Mafia Kingfish. And Mafia Kingfish was written by, I think his name is John Davis. And a doctor from New Orleans sued for defamation because the book uh, went into the, both the Kennedy uh, uh, assassination and the assassination of Martin Luther King. And the author stated that this doctor was involved in a conspiracy with James Earl Ray, uh, referenced the assassination of Dr. King. And so it was, uh, McGraw-Hill was the defendant, very good lawyers on both sides. Uh, it was highly contentious and unusual to see James Earl Ray testify by video. Um, the author had written several noted books, uh, the Guggenheims, the Kennedys, but he was probably one of the most pompous people I, I've ever seen testify. I have no hesitation in saying this uh, publicly. He was really pompous. The jury detected that immediately. Uh, he, he, his bearing was supercilious. Uh, and it was like he, he was far too important and had to be in this courtroom. Well, the jury clobbered him and McGraw-Hill. Uh, and I might say the doctor's reputation, although I think he was certainly innocent of the charge uh, that was uh, 
or, or the statements made in the book about him. He was a, a rascal of sorts, but they awarded at that time $2 million. So uh, it was a fascinating case. I had a case involving the Americans for Disabilities Act, which was res nova. In other words, there had been none like it. And it involved a dentist who, would, who refused to treat a patient with AIDS. And uh, that is just, just the prophylactic treatment, just teeth cleaning. Uh, and the American Dental Association stated that he should be doing it. He should, there's no reason to refuse to do it. And I had to look at the ADA to see if we could, the government was seeking to compel the man to do it or be fined. Well, I ordered the doctor to, to treat the person or be fined. And I realized that why the job is appointed for life because I would have been just handily defeated in any election. Uh, with the license plate case of the Choose Life case, which was a free speech case. It wasn't whether you're pro-abortion or not. It was about what can you put on your license plate and what can the legislature do uh, to prevent you from putting that on your license plate. That was an extremely controversial case. And it had nothing to do with my, my view on abortion or not. It was simply allowing the people who were pro pro-choice to put that on their license plate because to choose life, people, people had a license plate. So it's about speech, but that concept is hard to, hard to uh, explain except in one's opinion. And the only way a judge can really talk is in his or her opinion, in, in their writings. You can't comment on that, you can't, and I got letters from all over the place about from the the black bear people, because I enjoyed all, all such plates until the law was made constitutional, in my mind. While, while I was serving as a federal judge, I had the honor to be on the, the Judicial Council of the Fifth Circuit, on the Louisiana Law Institute, and on the uh, advisory committee uh, for the appellate rules. Uh, that entailed uh, meeting and examining the, the rules for appellate procedure in the federal courts. We would meet in Washington or some other venue, and uh, we, I was the only district judge on that committee. It was comprised of academics, lawyers, uh, appellate judges, and one district judge. On that committee, while I was serving, were uh, Judge Alito and Judge Roberts, both of whom became uh, Justice Roberts and Alito. So I got to know them and uh, it was a fulfilling experience as well. People know that being an Oracle III federal judge is a lifetime appointment. And it's the only lifetime appointment in, in this country as set forth in Article III of, the, of our Constitution. And about two years ago, my, my brother, who I mentioned again, Berwick, asked me, well, do, you do you plan to serve your entire term? Meaning, in brother talk, are you gonna die in office? Are you gonna die reading a motion for summary judgment? <laughs> uh, or conducting a trial? And I said, you know, that's a good point. No, I'm, I'm not. And I decided after 22 plus years, at a certain age that I was gonna step down from the bench and spend uh, the, the third chapter of my legal career in uh, actually in mediating, arbitrating, consulting, maybe help, help with uh, a strategy on a brief or that kind of thing. And I've really enjoyed it because as a federal judge, you're incre incredibly isolated. You really don't have any First Amendment rights and you don't deal with people in the way you did as a lawyer. You're, you're more aloof, you have to be, you're very cabin in what your conversation can be. You, be, you better be careful who you have lunch with because you don't want to give the appearance of impropriety. 
And I enjoyed my tenure as a federal judge, but I, I am enjoying actually dealing with people now on a more personal level, which I did enjoy as a lawyer and was one of the more satisfying things about being a lawyer. So I am uh, doing that now and, and hopefully uh, spending more time with, with grandchild and family and enriching my life. And my wife and I will travel and uh, more and see friends who live in other parts of the country and not be uh, completely tethered. Uh, and as a federal judge, you are obligated to be tethered to, to your public service job. Thank you.